People say the place I work at could cause a black hole. Total destruction of the Earth, tearing a fabric into time space. Some say what we're doing at CERN, that's the European Organization for Nuclear Research, was satanic. Against nature. Against the laws of God. I laughed at all of this. All we do at CERN is science stuff. We run a big particle collider underground in Geneva, Switzerland. Goes into France, too. All it does is smash energy together so we can discover and study new subatomic particles. But three nights ago, I saw something when I was riding my bike home late from a bar that shook me. My route home took me along a back area of CERN, a place where buildings gave way to open space and a giant statue of Shiva, the Indian god of destruction. It always seemed weird that a workplace would have such a statue, but it was a gift from the Indian government. They couldn't send it back and they had to put it somewhere, so I guess this back area was the most out of the way spot. At least, that's what I thought. But there, in front of the statue of Shiva, under the light of the full moon, it was a group of, I don't know, worshippers maybe? It looked evil, that's all I know. The stuff those conspiracy theorists always talked about. I stopped my bike and hid behind a tree, watching what was happening. There were five people wearing hooded cloaks, standing in a semicircle in front of Shiva. They looked like they were doing some sort of ritual, worshipping the god of destruction. The one leading the ritual was wearing animal horns, something from a deer maybe, I don't know. He was also holding a chalice. The rest of them all had their hands raised in front of them, towards the statue, towards the one wearing the horns. I watched for a few minutes to confirm I wasn't hallucinating. I mean, I had been drinking after all. But then I took off. I was scared I had been seen. The group of worshippers turned in my direction and started dancing in a circle. That was enough for me to get the hell out of there. I pedal home faster than I ever have before. What I had seen was bonkers. It couldn't have been real. It had to be a joke or something. I mean, there were a ton of conspiracy theories out there about what we were doing. Mostly, I thought, because our research was kept secret. The big underground tunnel we used that crossed from Geneva into France, well, that surely didn't help things either. I think that's why people thought it would explode or cause a black hole or something, especially because the word nuclear was in our name. But CERN always had answers for these conspiracy theories, though. They talked about how they were false, how silly they were, how all we did was science. But I had seen something in that field, in front of the Shiva statue. The CERN PR people couldn't tell me I was making up what I saw. It was a group, a group of pagans or devil worshippers or something doing a ritual. Normal God-fearing Christians would never do such a thing. I didn't want people thinking I was crazy, so I kept what I saw to myself. I mean, I kind of asked around at work on Monday, but I did it in a joking fashion, saying, Hey, you know what I heard about? I tried to play it off like I wasn't serious. Most of the responses I got were dismissive. Oh yeah? Been reading those conspiracy sites, huh? But then I got a response that surprised me. It came from Glenn, who worked in the corporate offices in Building 107. He said in hushed tones, You've seen the truth. Can't talk here. Meet me at Frank's tonight at 8. I didn't even have time to respond before he threw away his paper cup at the water cooler and left. I stood there confused. The truth? What did he mean by that? I was curious what he was talking about, so I decided to find out more. I decided to meet him at Frank's. Frank's was across the border in France, one of those small local bars some of the CERN people sometimes went to. The place was lined with mahogany wood paneling, which gave it a closed off feel. Not the most welcoming place, but somehow suitable, I thought. I arrived at Frank's promptly at 8. There weren't many people in the bar, I guess because it was dinner time. Yeah, most people eat around 8 p.m. in these parts, and because it was a Monday night. In the booth towards the back, I saw Glenn. I'd seen Glenn on occasions at CERN, though I didn't work with him. We never went beyond general chit-chat, actually. I was in building 513, he was in 107. CERN was a giant place spread across many acres and many buildings. Most people never set foot into other buildings unless it was for a meeting or something. The only time I saw Glenn was when I had to go into the administrative building where he worked. Actually, I wasn't even sure what Glenn did at CERN. 
Something high level, I thought, given his location. Over a drink, I told Glenn what I had seen, the ritual, the man wearing the horns, the chalice. As I told my tale, I felt like I was crazy. It all sounded so fantastical. But Glenn just nodded the whole time I spoke. He didn't look at me like I was a nut job, which made me feel okay. After I finished telling him what I saw, I asked him what he meant by what he told me, that I had seen the truth. Glenn looked around to make sure no one else was in earshot, then he got real low to the table. He told me in whispered tones that he had been hunting down Satanists for years at CERN. He was trying to get in good with them, infiltrate their group, kind of like what the FBI does with outlaw motorcycle gangs, try to be one of them and then take them down from the inside, expose them. Glenn told me CERN was actually started by a satanic New World Order, the people that pull the strings in the world. They worship death, he said, and CERN was designed to bring about the destruction of the world. He said that's why there's a Shiva statue on CERN grounds. He asked, what other place has a Shiva statue like that? Seems weird, doesn't it? I said, yeah, but it was a gift from the Indian government. He told me that was a ruse, a trick, just like the justification for CERN itself. He said the satanic death worshippers at CERN planted the Indian government story in the media. That way no one would ask questions, and if they do, they could point to them as being crazy. Glenn said, why do you think CERN goes through so much trouble to deny all these rumors? The lady doth protest too much, methinks, Glenn said. He asked, why are the rumors even there in the first place if they're not real? Where did they come from? Who would make this stuff up? He said people don't have these sorts of rumors about other companies. Isn't it a little strange, he asked. Glenn said the whispers exist because there's truth to all of it. Glenn told me there was a group of shadow administrators, ones that aren't on the payroll or any org chart. He said they're the ones that really run the show at CERN. These are the ones he's trying to get in with, to expose. Then he lowered his voice even more. He told me I need to be careful now. It's possible I was spotted. I said I wasn't, but he said, don't be so sure. He said, watch my back at all times. The way he said it got me scared. On the bike ride home, my head was on a swivel. I looked this way and that. I even stopped multiple times to look behind me. I felt eyes on me. I didn't see anyone, but I felt them. That night, I had trouble falling asleep, but I eventually passed out. I woke up with a start and saw I was outside, strapped to a table. Around me a thick fog, above me the stars. I thought I was dreaming. I looked around and there was a shadow in the fog, a robed figure holding deer antlers. No, I said, this can't be real. But yet, it was. I could feel the dampness on the air of my skin. I was kidnapped from my apartment and taken to Shiva, a satanic sacrifice. Glenn was right. I screamed and fought against my restraints, but it was no use. There was no help. No one would be coming by this back lot of CERN. No one had any reason to be over this way. In the fog, souls danced around me. Hooded figures painted the color of night. The one carrying the horn spoke to me, getting down close to my face. It was someone I had seen before at CERN, but I didn't know his name. I think I saw him in the administrator building, the one Glenn worked at. Maybe one of those shadow administrators he talked about. The darkness will purify your soul, the robed figure said, his cancerous breath making me wince. Through the sign of the horns, the gates of hell will open. The ancient one will return and this world will be no more. Your blood our sacrifice. The other figures whooped and hollered and danced in a circle around me. The priest or whatever he was, he raised those horns above his head, their tips pointing down at me, ready to pierce through my midsection. The night seemed darker now, the stars dimmer. It was going to be my end. I was a sacrifice to an evil god for an evil purpose. No, I screamed, no! I jerked and thrashed, but it was no use. The horns raised higher, the priest stretched out his arms, ready to gut me, to have my blood spill for the god of destruction. I closed my eyes and said a prayer. There was nothing else I can do. 
I prayed for Mary to save my soul. I prayed for help. As I said my final amen, I heard a loud bang. It sounded like a firecracker popping and it made me flinch and my ears ring. I opened my eyes. The horns were no longer above me. The road dancers had scattered. I cranked my head to where the priest was standing and I saw Glenn holding a pistol. Its slide recoiled backwards, his fingers still on the trigger. My prayers had been answered. Glenn untied me and when I got up, I saw the satanic priest crumbled in a pool of blood, his horns resting on the top of his limp body. We gotta get out of here, Glenn said. I took off running, heading in the direction of the main road, hoping there would be someone, anyone that could help us. I turned back to look at Glenn, assuming he was behind me, but he wasn't. I stopped and shouted his name, Glenn, Glenn! No response. I squinted through the fog and that's when I saw it. Glenn, the horns through his belly, blood pumping out of his mouth like a fountain. I wanted to run back to save him, but I knew it would be suicide. Now, I know there's no evidence of this happening. I know there was no blood found at the scene. But you must listen to me. Warn the people. Tell them what I've told you. I am not crazy. I am not crazy. I speak the truth. The world is in great danger. I can't believe it. I've been busting my ass for 10 years now at this company. Gave them everything I got. I've worked so hard it cost me my marriage. And this is how they reward me? They promote that bitch over me? Me? I've got double her experience. What's she done that's so great? So she's from the UK just like our new VP. So what? Is this the way it works now? Reward your country at birth rather than hard work? And what's that mean for me? How does this red-blooded American get promoted? She probably sucked the VP's dick or something. You know, slobbing that knob under his desk, him teaching her how to play the clarinet. A little jobby before the VP heads home to the missus. I used to really enjoy my job. That's why I put my whole life into it. But now, with this young know-nothing as my boss, I'm in hell. I mean pure fucking office hell. It's a toxic stew of hatred every time I scan my badge and walk through those doors. My heart starts pumping, my blood pressure starts rising, and I feel an anger inside of me. Then I see her, that smug British face, that puffy fish and chips eating face. I seethe every time I see her. As a manager, she's struggling and unsure of herself, so she's all Devil Wears Prada now. I mean, a total bitch with a capital B. Do this, she says, do that. She has no business managing people. I mean none. Fuck it if she thinks she's going to get the best out of me. I've been screwed. That's what I've been. There's no justification for what happened. And the VP thinks he's all great too. God's gift to the company or something. This guy's totally fake. A Botox injected suit wearing baby kissing corporate politician. Plastic banana. That's all he is. He won't even give anyone under him the time of day, except for his new shagging partner, my new boss. It was our summer pizza party when I thought of the path forward, the way I could get promoted. You're in charge of your career, our HR department says. Yes, yes I am. The VP and my boss will be over for dinner any moment. I thought breaking bread would be the best thing to do. Not some big office pizza party. Just the three of us, you know, really get to talk and know each other in a more intimate setting. This was a thing back in the 50s or whatever, right? Invite the boss over, have him meet the wife and kids. Too bad they won't meet my wife and kids on account of my divorce, on account of me putting in so many hours at the office that my wife left me. But that's okay. I have a wonderful dinner prepared. Some nice wine too, you know, I gotta impress. When the doorbell rings and I open it, I'm not surprised. They've arrived together. I smile that plastic smile at them, the one that shows all my teeth, the one that the VP does at the office. John, Rita, I say. Welcome to my home. Come in, come in. We brought you this, Rita says, handing me a bottle of wine. 
I inspect the label even though I really don't know anything about wine other than what Safeway puts on the end cap. Smells good in here, John says. That fucking politician is still wearing a suit. Does he not have any other clothes? What's wrong with this guy? I think you'll enjoy it, I say. Made it special for you two. We take a seat and I pass the turkey roast. Good stuff, John says with that fake smile. Hmm, yes, you'll have to give me the recipe, Rita says, mimicking her boss. She's got one hand under the table, presumably jerking John off as he eats. I watch them stuff food in their mouths, but I don't touch the food myself. They don't even notice. They just keep shoveling in more meat into their mouths. I smile and nod as they chew and swallow. I open the wine that Rita brought and took a sip. It's good. Better than the stuff I usually buy. Of course, she can afford it on account of that promotion she got. Eat up, I say as they chomp away. There's plenty of food. As John reaches for a second helping of mashed potatoes, I notice it. He starts twitching. His hand spasms uncontrollably. He flashes a concerned look and retrieves his hand, holding it down with his other in his lap. I can tell he's panicked, but he doesn't say anything. Rita's head starts in next, twitchy, uncontrollable spasms just like John's hand and arm. She lets out a moan. They look at each other, sweaty and scared and unsure of what's happening. Then they look my way, their eyeballs displaying fear. I just smile and nod. Enjoying dinner, I ask. They don't respond, but I'm not surprised. The strict nine has taken over now. They no longer have any control of their body. John cries, his whole body going into convulsions. He arches his back. The spasms get worse, as does the pain. It looks like both of them are vibrating, their muscles moving nonstop, making them twitch so much that they fall out of their chairs, screaming in agony on the floor. They twitch and jerk and vibrate and scream. John and Rita look possessed, their spines contorting so much it looks like they'll snap in half. Severe hyperextension, the look of someone getting folded like the laundry. They can't even get a word out, only scream and cry as their bodies twitch and jerk nonstop. From what I read, it'll continue like this, violent uncontrollable spasms throughout the whole body, crippling spasticity. It'll be another two or maybe three hours before they die. The spasms lead to a whole host of issues. Lactic overload in the muscles, hypothermia, skeletal muscle breaking down. It's supposed to be an excruciatingly horrible way to go. They'll either die from exhaustion or from when they lose control of their ability to breathe and they asphyxiate. Me, I'm in charge of my career, I tell John and Rita as they flip flop like a fish out of water on my carpet. Isn't that what HR says? I take another sip of the wine. It's really good. Very good. I'll have to make note of the brand. Maybe it will be the first bottle I buy once I'm promoted. You know, since the company now has no other choice but to promote me.